In the previous chapters, we saw how line transect sampling is used to estimate prey animal numbers from direct visual sightings. We also saw how tiger numbers can be estimated through capture recapture sampling using camera traps. These intensive sampling methods work well in areas that are relatively small, such as a single national park or reserve. However, it may not be practical to use these techniques over larger landscapes such as entire countries or large regions within a country as it will require too much money, manpower and equipment. For example, line transect sampling requires a lot of skilled effort to get adequate observations. Thousands of kilometers of transects may have to be walked by field workers trained in the use of instruments such as rangefinder and compass. It is not easy to find a large number of people with such skills. Camera trapping not only requires skilled manpower, but also involves the deployment of a large number of cameras. Therefore, using these techniques for an entire region or country becomes an impractically expensive and time-consuming exercise. Further, in some regions, tigers or prey animals may occur at very low densities. In such situations, acquiring adequate samples of visual detections or photographic captures might require far too much effort for which resources may not be available. How then can we reliably assess the status of tigers or prey animal populations over large landscapes and regions? We can do this by using a method known as occupancy sampling. The focus of occupancy sampling is not to find out how many animals there are in a large landscape, but to determine where the animals are distributed over that landscape. The main objective in an occupancy survey is to find out what proportion of the landscape is actually occupied by the animals being surveyed. Is 10% of the habitat occupied, 20% or 90%? In conducting occupancy surveys, it is not necessary for field workers to actually see prey animals or tigers or to capture them in camera traps. It is enough if they detect and record the signs that are left behind by these animals. As animals go about their daily activities, they generate lots of signs, such as tracks, dung, or scats. It is easier to detect such signs than to see the animals themselves. This is particularly true of areas with low animal densities. Detection of animal signs does not require advanced equipment or technical skills and can be accomplished even by people with only basic field skills. So, how do we conduct an occupancy survey? For example, if we wanted to do a tiger occupancy survey across the entire state of Karnataka in South India, how would we go about it? Here is how. First, we take a map of the region. Over this map, we superimpose land cover information to help us eliminate areas that clearly cannot support tigers. What remains on the map now are just the forested areas where tigers might occur. Then, we superimpose a grid consisting of equal sized cells of about 200 square kilometers each. Next, we eliminate some more cells in which the forest remaining is either too small or unsuitable for tigers to live in. At the end of this elimination round, we will be left with the actual number of grid cells to conduct the survey. But how do we arrive at the appropriate size of grid cells? Why use a 200 square kilometer cell in the case of tigers in Karnataka? For occupancy surveys, the size of each cell 
should be greater than the largest possible home range of the animal being surveyed. In Karnataka forests, the average home range of a female tiger is about 50 square kilometers. The home range of an adult male tiger in the same landscape, however, is typically three times larger. Therefore, tiger occupancy surveys in this landscape should use a cell size of about 200 square kilometers. Once the cell sizes have been determined for the landscape and grids are imprinted on a map of the area, the occupancy survey can begin. Each survey team typically consists of two to four field workers. As mentioned earlier, it is not necessary for field workers to actually see tigers or to camera trap them. It is enough if they detect and record the signs that are left behind by them. It is important that survey teams search each cell for animal signs according to a predetermined survey design. They should not walk around the habitat at random. The survey route is divided into segments of equal length, which are known as replicates. Each type of tiger sign is recorded only once per segment. For instance, even if several scats or several sets of tracks are found in a segment, they should be recorded just once. The field workers should be able to identify tracks and scats of tigers accurately. Whenever a tiger sign is encountered, the location of the sign should be recorded using a handheld GPS unit. If a GPS unit is not available, one can use a map and compass technique for recording the location. A proper occupancy survey data form should be used for noting down the observations. The field workers should cover the entire cell following the route specified in the survey design. They should use their common sense to work their way around obstacles such as rivers, swamps and other logistical constraints.